It's time to install the electrical in the avionics system. As I said before, the fun part for me. This time I'm going to walk you through the process I used to decide on which avionics I wanted, drawing up the schematics, performing a load analysis, and the all-important panel layout. It's been a few months since I made a video, but frankly, I've had, been having so much fun doing the avionics that I had trouble tearing myself away to make one of these videos. But as you see here in the past few months, I've been making a lot of progress. Let me show you how I got here. When deciding on which avionics suite to go with, I narrowed it down to either Garmin or Dynon, as these two seem to be the most feature-rich of all the entrants and have a good following in the kit-built world. It was actually fun researching all the different systems. Early on in the build, I decided this would be a VFR-only airplane with night capability. So with that starting point, I narrowed it down to a comparison between the Garmin G3X and Dynon Skyview HDX systems. I first created a list of features I was looking for, then identified what units from each manufacturer supported those features. It was a tad bit of apples and oranges comparison. That's why I focused on features instead of boxes as the primary driver. One thing I did settle on pretty early is that I wanted a big primary flight display dominating the left panel and additional panel mounting units for comm and transponder. This way there would be a degree of modularity as each of these primary functions would be independent of each other in the event of a failure. Then I added the current prices for each of the units, including the connector kits, with a few options listed on the bottom. So overall, it looks like both systems arrived at about the same cost, about $14,000, give or take. I know people out there moan that the Garmin's are so much more expensive, but in this situation, the cost between Garmin and Dynon are quite comparable. Granted, I did this price comparison over a year ago, and it appears lately that both have increased their prices just a little. But I had to decide on an avionics suite when I was building the wings, as I had to mount both the pitot tube and the magnetometer in the wing. But ultimately, I decided on the Garmin G3X display with the GTR200 COM and GTX335 ADS-B transponder. Now that price was eliminated from the equation, it came down to a few things that swayed my decision towards Garmin. First, Garmin is an established company with a vast amount of support, not only with their service, but also in their engineering background with the trickle-down technology from their business jet systems. Second, Garmin systems have far greater interface capability with third-party sensors and other Garmin avionics. Third, the Garmin systems incorporate a far better user interface, adhering to sound human factors principles in their design. Then lastly, eh, Garmin and I go way back, all the way back to their beginning in the early 1990s. Since then, I've installed their units, used them in flight, taught them both in flight and the classroom, and developed many training courses for both classroom and online delivery. So this was an easy decision to go with the Garmin systems. The next step was to create a set of working schematics. So after looking through all the install manuals and determining what features from each unit I wanted, I started with blank sheets and just started drawing. It's amazing how those junior high school drafting class skills still come in handy. I always use cardstock instead of copy paper, as it's more durable on the shop bench and doesn't tear from all the multiple changes. And there were lots of changes. I know all these connections between the components seems rather intimidating, as every unit seems to talk to every other unit. But I just started with one and built from there. Everybody has their own method, but when I take on a project like this, as I do when creating a classroom or online training course, I usually start in the middle and work towards both ends. I don't know why, but it works for me. I ended up with about 20 individual sheets, with some covering multiple units and multiple connectors. I also left a few of the pinouts blank, such as the grounding block pin assignments, knowing that I would add those along the way. These are just working drawings, as when the electrical system is fully completed and tested, I'll transfer these pencil drawings into a complete set of professional looking drawings that will live with the airplane forever. The next step was to conduct an electrical load analysis. 
so as to not overload the alternator, which in the case of the Rotax is capable of producing 30 amps. I'm able to use all of that current because I'll be implementing current and voltage gauges in the G3X. Without those gauges, I will be limited to 80% of the alternator output. The AC4313 calls to use the ASTM F2490 standards for aircraft electrical load analysis. But since I'm not certifying this airplane in a normal or utility category, I really don't need to go through the detailed and lengthy load analysis called for in the ASTM standards. So I use the current draw specs from the Garmin manuals, component documents, and direct measurements to arrive at a total current draw required from the alternator, taking into account whether each individual load was continuous or intermittent. The total for continuous draw is about 15 amps, while the intermittent draw is about another 15 amps, mostly due to the cigarette lighter. So I'll be drawing nearly the fully 30 amps under the worst case scenario, at night, on autopilot, with the heater on, transmitting on the comm, and taxing the cigarette lighter to the max. So I'm within the capability of the alternator, but it'll be unlikely everything will be on at once. As for the circuit breaker values, most of the Garmin and Rotax install drawings dictate what size to use, so that makes it easy. But since I was creating some of the systems myself, such as the heater and lighting circuits, I needed to mock these up on the bench to find the current draw for the load analysis, the wire size, and the breaker ratings using the charts in the AC4313. It's a little bit of a process to determine the proper wire size as length, operating temperature, intermittent versus continuous, and whether it's in a bundle or conduit are all factors. But it's worth going through the calculations so as to not overtax a wire, which, if not big enough, could possibly cause a fire someday. The next step was to design the layout of the instrument panel. As an avionics technician and human factors engineer, I have lots of experience with panel layouts. I've designed quite a few of these throughout my career, like this one. First was to get all, or at least most, of the components that will be mounted in the panel. This shopping list of switches and breakers is derived from the schematics. The expensive stuff, like the PFD unit and radios, I want to purchase at the last possible moment before I fly. So I just made cardboard mock-ups of those and purchased the install kits from Garmin. And I always use high quality mil-spec switches and breakers. Automotive and industrial quality components are not designed for the extreme environments we encounter in the aerospace world. So even though they look cool and are less expensive, their altitude performance, reliability, and durability are quite questionable. To begin the actual layout, I traced the exact factory panel outline on heavy masking paper, then taped it securely to the bench, aligned with the edge so a rafter square can be used to keep things aligned. Next was to define the mounting area limits, both from behind the panel and from the front. I carefully measured the panel mount structure and drew those limits inside the panel outline. Then to determine the viewing area from the front, I needed to first determine the design eye reference point. This is a position in space where the pilot's eye is located while fully strapped in the seat with all the controls within easy reach. The point needs to be aligned vertically and longitudinally to a normal seating position, but especially aligned laterally with the center of the pilot's seat. And right about there is where my dominant eye would be. So from that point, three things are determined. The lateral center eye point, the overlap of the glare shield, and the arm reach across the panel. These limits are then transferred to the masking paper, defining the area where components can be mounted, while also allowing room for all the labels. As an industry standard for many decades now, circuit breakers and enunciators have their labels below, while switches, knobs, and controls have their labels above. This standard is in place for a few reasons, but primarily, when your hand is actuating a switch handle, your hand should not obscure the label. The centerpiece of the panel is the 10-inch G3X primary display unit, so it must be positioned first. The center of the attitude depiction must be aligned with the lateral design eye reference point. If it isn't, the pilot sits crooked in the seat, compensating for a misaligned attitude display and eventually causing discomfort and pain. So I marked that on the masking paper. As an industry standard, the engine gauges must be on the side of the display closest to the engine controls. This print from Garmin is for a tandem seat airplane or right side with the engine controls to the left of the co-pilot. Fortunately, the G3X allows configuring the engine gauges on the right of the display. So it will really be like this, which allows a centered attitude depiction to the design eye reference point. 
Then after the PFD is positioned, the next highest priority is the comm and transponder. So they will mount in the center of the panel. I mocked up the racks with the glare shield in place to ensure they were as high as possible, but also clearing the slope glare shield. Then just below them are the primary electrical and engine FADEX switches, as I'm installing the Rotax 912 IS engine. The circuit breakers will mount on the far right, as they don't need to be accessed quickly in flight. Then also within easy reach and in the pilot's primary view are two emergency controls, the Smart Glide push button and the ELT controls. And something I see far too often are emergency controls, namely ELT switches, relegated to the extreme far right panel. Like this, or this, or this, or this, or this one. So just picture yourself with an engine failure. You're gliding down into rocky terrain, tightening up your seat belts for a rough dead stick landing, and suddenly you remember to turn on the ELT so the satellites can be pinged at least once before you crash. And guess what? Remember this, you won't be able to reach it. So just saying, please mount the ELT controls within easy reach. The RAN supplied radio mount plates, which support the panel longitudinally, are too low to help with mounting the radios. So I'm spacing these to mount the heater core, which will be far behind the panel. These plates also provide a handy place to mount the engine interface unit, carbon monoxide detector, and overhead light timer. There are two rows of 10 breakers for a total of 20 holes, with the entire bottom row as the avionics bus. The top row is the main bus, which at the moment is not filled completely as I'm providing room for future growth. The orphans, and every panel has them, are located on the inside of the right panel, working my way up from the bottom. First is the heater valve switch, then heater core fan speed controller, the small carbon monoxide detector test button, the covered ECU battery backup switch, avionics and floodlight dimmer controls, and last is the overhead light button. Then mounted below the main instrument panel is this little sub-panel, which will contain the throttle in the middle, starter key switch on one side, and the start enable switch on the other side. Now, I'm not gonna install a controllable pitch prop during the initial build, but I wanna leave room for the controller in the panel. This two and a quarter inch hole saw represents the size of the controller, so I've reserved a spot for it right above the throttle. Now that I have the panel designed, it's time to fabricate all the component mountings, both in the panel and the remote shelves. Then it's on to a little bit of the tedious work, which is the actual wiring, uh, the fun part, as I said for me, uh, but that'll be in the next video.